Pericles by Mark Herman, published by GMT, is a game that has similar, several similarities with a previous game by Herman, which was Churchill. Churchill was about diplomacy and, and military elements and their interaction in World War II. Uh, Pericles is about the Peloponnesian War and it is about the politics and diplomacy within each city-state and then of course the effect that that has on the military in the broader in the broader theater of operations so this is a game for four players for exactly four players yes there are bots there are AIs that you can use to replace some of the players but not really well I mean it's it's not gonna be the same thing the fun the idea is that you want exactly four players, two Spartan players and two and two Athenian players. So each player controls one or two factions within each city. So each turn you will have a series of debates within that city. So the two Athenian players and the two Spartan players fighting within the city to uh, to figure out how to take control of particular issues, how to advance their their political position uh, against the opponent within the same city but then at the same time after this political struggle within the city is resolved or to say it comes to, to a point where you need to move on um, then the effects of that struggle within each city state will be reflected on the map on the board in which you have military operations so yes at the end uh, we the two Athenian players may struggle to see who is going to resolve a certain diplomatic mission who is going to resolve a certain military mission but at the end if we don't cooperate and coordinate at least a little bit on how to use these military and diplomatic elements when we go and see how these impact the war then our city state is gonna lose lose the war so very nice idea there I love it I love that idea that you have a struggle within the city a mix of cooperation and competition and you have to at least cooperate a little bit because you cannot win without cooperation but at the, at the end you you will win alone your faction only will win you're trying to be the winning, the controlling faction in the city-state that wins the war. So diplomacy, politics, uh, and military elements all mixed together. The potential for a phenomenal game is here. It is, however, a game that is very complex. It's very hard to get into, and this, I think, will be a, a big minus, a big, uh, a big limitation for many players. But before we get there, and before we try to get a general assessment of the game, I want to show you how the game works in general. This is going to be a very quick, very general overview of some of the main concepts of the game. I'm not even going to teach you or tell you about all of the main procedures, about all of the fundamental things that you need to know. I'll tell you about some of the things that you need to know. So I will exclude some of the basic things. Uh, most of the secondary things, uh, most of the exceptions to the rules and almost all of the exceptions to those exceptions. There are probably also some exceptions to those exceptions, uh, but I don't have time to talk about those. I, I want to give you a sense, I want to give you a general gist, I want to give you a taste of how the game how the game plays and then you may see if you can find uh, I, I don't know I haven't seen if GNT has posted a PDF of the rules they usually do I think it would be a good idea if they haven't yet so that you can watch this video or any other video there you get a general sense why it works and then you can uh, see the rules more in depth to get a better a better sense how the game works in any case let me tell you about the general concepts and ideas behind Pericles this is the board of the game, it is a mounted board and it looks really nice. At first sight it seems a little busy but actually it's very functional, it works very well and I still find it aesthetically pleasing. It is divided in two main areas, here a political area which is used by the players to resolve the political debates within their city and then a main display that shows you what's going on in the war where people will move their troops uh, and do the war game stuff and in general they will apply the effects of the decisions that they made here those effects will resonate in here the game is played by four parties so it would be ideal if you could have four players we have two Athenian parties we have the aristocrats and the demagogues and then we have to Spartan parties, the Europontid and the Aegead. And again, ideally, 
the best thing would be if you can have four players, one per one player hmm, per party. At the beginning of a turn, standard thing, so many games, you draw a random event card and implement the effect, a little bit of randomness there. Then players uh, will start the political phase, which is super important. It is when the players decide which issues will be debated, and then after they've been debated and assigned to the players, these issues will be will be resolved on the board. Pretty much it's a phase where there is a political discussion that establishes what actions are going to be actually performed this turn. Players will use cards during the debate phase, and as you can see, these cards can be used in two different ways. This is the side used by this player, and this is the side used by that player. They're color coded. There is a number here, which is the number that is used during the political challenge as players are debating the issues, a bonus that is used if the issue that is being debated corresponds to the symbol on the card, and then a number of these tokens here which are used to perform actions. Uh, the assembly can be neutral or can be controlled by one player or the other. At the beginning of a turn, the players need to decide which issues will be debated. Very often the event card will add some issues and will tell you place this or that issue there. Then the player that controls the assembly will go first and will start placing one of the issues. Say, suppose I want to have control of the military. I want to have a chance of controlling the military, then the other player places another issue, then the, the player with the majority places issues in the middle, and the player that doesn't have majority also places issues in the middle. Pretty much the players get to place an issue on their side of the track each, and then they select a number of issues that go in the zero, in the zero, in the neutral area. What happens is that after this there will be six debates, six issues will be debated, or I should say issues will be debated six times because it can be that it's the same issue is debated six times, it doesn't have to be six different ones. Players will alternate <clears throat> selecting issues, for example, it's my turn and I say I want to debate uh, this issue, the league issue. They will be debated and the issue may stay there or may move after the debate and pretty much at the end of the debate phase all the issues that are on a player side of the track are controlled by that player. To resolve the issues, if you play Churchill, it's very simple, the players simply simultaneously commit a card face down then they reveal it they reveal it and you look at the total uh, at the number up here which may be modified by uh, by the bonus depending on the issue that is being debated if a number of played by the two players is higher than the other then the issue that is being debated moves in the direction of that player by the difference between the two numbers I want to get this military token, I play a 5, you play a 3, then the military token moves by 2 in my direction. And this phase will take place in Sparta and in Athens at the same time. So if you're four players, these two, this, this phase can be played by the players individually because in this phase there's no interaction between Sparta and Athens, it's all within Sparta and within Athens. So the players will play cards and will uh, assign these issues, which is really uh, the heart of the game because then you're gonna resolve those issues. Once this is done, it's time to get the tokens that will allow you to actually perform the issues on the map. So for example, so you will trade some of these tokens with these other tokens which pretty much have the same symbol, pretty much have the same idea because they represent the same action, but they tell you which of the two parties controls that issue. So if that issue, the league issue, has been debated, somebody controls it, if it goes on this side, then this player will take this token and put in their pool of active tokens they can use this round. If it is this other player, then that player will take this token and put it in their pool. So you will have, after all is said and done, a bunch of tokens. So for example, these are the issues that I want and now I take from my personal pool of tokens these three tokens 
and these three tokens are the ones that will actually be used and will go on the board. Also I have two rumors tokens that I can use to trick my opponent. So after the debate phase everybody will have a pool of tokens such as these. Also honor. Honor is a very important uh, element in the game. It is a numerical value, you keep track of that on this track here and pretty much is what you need to win. There are a lot of things that will give you honor and having the majority of influence in the assembly after the debate phase is something that gives you honor. A lot of other things will give you honor or force you to lose honor. In any case, after we're done and everybody has these tokens here, it is time to, to play them. It is time to start placing them on the board. Uh, the board, actually. A couple of other concepts here. The board, as you can see, is a point... <clears throat> to point map with large boxes connected by different types of connections with different rules. Game pieces, there are three main game pieces. Uh, cubes are land units, these rectangles here, those bars are navy, and then we have bases. There are also four uh, groups that are controlled by our city-states. We have the main Spartans, then we have the Spartan allies, we have the Athenians that are blue, and then we have their allies. There you go. Bases, uh, well, don't move, but they may flip, but uh, of course, then we have uh, meta units, land units, and navy that can move using the connections. So, it is time, finally, to use our to use our tokens. The way it works is that in order of honor, we alternate placing a token of of, from this pool at a time. So that player goes and then the next player goes and places say a token there then another player goes and places a token there then so on and so forth. We simply place these tokens that we had, rumors and good stuff, on the board face down. Now you can place tokens in areas that already have tokens of other players, so even your own players. When you do so you add them as a stack as a stack, one on top of the other, and the order is extremely important because the order is LIFO, L-I-F-O, last in, first out. That means that when we resolve these tokens, we start from the top of the stack and we go down. Which may sometimes uh, lead to some uh, gamey effects, because after we have placed all of our tokens, then we alternate, uh, well, the players one at a time go on uh, resolving them. So when it is, say, the Spartan's turn, the Spartan player that is currently active needs to choose one of the Spartan tokens, which are visible, flips it face up, and resolves the effect. And we'll see later what those effects are. So, uh, it's my turn, I decide, okay, I'm gonna resolve this one, okay, I'm gonna perform a league action, etc, etc. Then, and suppose that this is uh, the situation, then the Athenians need to resolve one of the tokens, so they choose one of these blue tokens, and the Athenians choose this token, resolve it. Then it's time again for the Spartans, and the Spartans now can only choose that one, because this one, there, because their tokens down here are not visible. The gaming thing that I was referring to is in the fact that you can manipulate the stacks, and maybe this is part of the intention, by placing some of your tokens on top of an enemy stack and then delay resolving them as much as possible. Um, we pretty much mean that if you have a sense that they placed a military in an area and they're gonna attack you, you can put a worthless token there and delay the resolution of that battle. It just it may cause some like gamey effects, the way you can manipulate the order and the timing simply by putting a counter on top of the stack at the right time. I don't know, it feels a little gamey, feels a little abstract. But the general idea is that we keep alternating flipping face up and resolving tokens of our party until all tokens have been resolved. Now, what are the actions that these uh, things do? Well, a lot of options, a lot of options, and luckily enough we have a player aid that tells us how that works. A lot of different actions, uh, as you can see. 
some uh, common ones. Let's say some simple one, simple ones. Uh, the games, uh, if you are resolving <coughs> the games issue, then you simply gain honor in times of peace, or you gain Theodis tokens if available. Again, these tokens will be very useful later because pretty much it's the currency that you spend to perform actions on the board. The Crypteia, something that only the Spartans have, it allows them to remove treachery. And there are other actions that will allow the players to add treachery. When you add treachery on the map, what the treachery does is that it allows the controlling player to uh, take control of bases of the opponent. Diplomacy. Diplomacy can be used in war or peace. So yes, then there are this... Uh, well, you can. Uh, the two states, the city states, can be at war or at peace. Um, you can still attack each other when you're at war, by the way, uh, when you're at peace, by the way. Uh, just the, pretty much the main limitation when there is peace is that you cannot enter areas that contain enemy pieces. But if there already are areas that contain pieces controlled by the two players, then by all means, go ahead and, and feel free. And feel free to attack. But we're talking about diplomacy. Now, if it's in a contested or enemy controlled theater, you can commit up to three Stratagos tokens. Okay, this is. Fall. Bear with me. If the Stratagos plus the friendly treachery. Suppose I have to. If the Stratagos plus the Friendly Treachery is greater than the military unit value plus twice the enemy bases, you convert a base into a friendly allied base and remove the Friendly Treachery. And you gain honor. It's a complicated way of saying you're creating a critical mass of Stratagos tokens and Treachery tokens. When you have enough of those, you get to convert an enemy base into one of yours and you gain enough honor. If you fail to do so in the current turn, then the Stratagos tokens that you played turn into treachery tokens that keep getting piled up. This way, turn after turn, your Stratagos tokens can be converted into treachery tokens. And this is when the Spartan Crypteia is useful because again, the Crypteia, which is the secret police, goes there and destroys those destroys those tokens. And this is if you're doing diplomacy in a control, contested or enemy controlled theater. In a friendly controlled theater then you can use diplomacy to remove tokens. If it's in a neutral theater there's a procedure that may allow you uh, to get a base. You secretly commit 0 to 5 of these tokens. The enemy controlling faction um, may control may also add tokens like, secretly. You compare what they have, plus each side reveals a battle card, a battle card. You compare the results, adding the battle card to the number of tokens that the players have committed. You compare the results, and if the combined strategos plus the card value of the active players two times or greater than the enemy value, then you build an ally base. It's pretty much a way of starting new bases, uh, but the opponent, but it's not that easy, and the opponent can counteract that by committing strategos tokens and by well by being lucky and, and drawing a big card. So as you can see, the game has a lot of different procedures, just that there are many different things that you can do, and each comes with its own mini game, with its own mini procedure. League. How do you resolve league actions? If you're playing a league action, as, as a reminder, if you're playing a league action in a friendly or control contested theater, you can do one of these things. You can expend Stratagos tokens to build a league base. You can expend Stratagos tokens to convert a league base to a city base. So from, again, one of your allies to one of your main dudes. If a league base, you can build a naval or two land units there or you can remove uh, treachery. We'll do. We'll look at the military later because it's so. It is its own uh, mini game or just game within the game. The oracle allows you to gain honor or gain honor and remove enemy league units. You're pretty much spreading bad rumors about them and they retire in shame. They or you may get treachery on the map. Ostracism gives you political 
political control. War and peace may change the status of, well, if you're at war, you may get to peace. If, you're in, if the states are at peace, it may become war. The military. There are two ways of doing military. One is a simple or simplified way. It's called the raid. Pretty much is almost not really a fight. It's just an adjustment of adjustment of stats. I'm just adding random pieces on the board because they look cute. For the raid, where is the summary for the raid? I wanted to have that. Da, 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 da. The raid, here it is. The contested theater. You may contest the raid, you commit three strategos, then you reveal a battle card, and the enemy controlling faction removes strategos equal to the card value. It's pretty much a way of reducing the number of resources of the opponent and gain some honor. It's a quick grab of honor, just like a raid should be a quick, simple, and painful thing. As for the main military ideas, remember, you will start a mess, you will start action in the military by placing a military token. Then you reveal that token. Oh, look at that, I place a token there so we can do some stuff. And after that happens, you can move units to the area where you placed your military token. You commit strategos tokens and then you can move military units. Military units move along these connections. There is an extremely verbose and after way um, description that says how you move and especially the idea is like how enemy pieces pin you down. You, if you're moving in areas that contain enemy pieces, very often you have to leave units behind to match that number of units. Other than that, uh, you can move an unlimited distance. Again, there are a couple of other restrictions, but there aren't movement points. The point is that you're trying to move units close to your theater. And it can be done, and the rules even say that, it can, be, it can perfectly be done in a gamey way. That is, since uh, there are times where units moving will be pinned down by enemy units, and you're not forced to move in a straight line from where you are to the theater or the operation, you can move units in a gamey way, pretty much knowing that some will be pinned down and some will continue moving. So you, uh, you're you using, you're maximizing the game system to get some extra movement in there with a single military action. So the military action, if you use it for a campaign, includes moving units towards, uh, even though it's in a straight line, towards the place where you spend the military token and at the end resolving a battle. Resolving a battle implies uh, piling resources in that area, drawing a card and comparing the total value at the point of the resources you piled up plus, plus the card that you drew. There are two types of battle, can be land or naval, it's uh, pretty much the same idea in general, but for the fact that land and naval units of course have different values. You total the value of all of the things that you have in there. Uh, land, for example, if you're fighting a land battle, uh, which is what you fight in an area with a brown edge, then the Spartan land units have a combat value of 2. Everybody else a combat value of 1. Each base has value of 2. Each Strategos token a value of 1, because the defender also may commit Stratego tokens. Treachery that is there is worth points. You total all these things, you draw a card and add the value to the total, and at the point the players will have a total numerical value and you compare it and the winner of course is the player with the highest total and the loser must lose uh, units based on the difference between the two values. This is how it works. First uh, the loser will take uh, hits and uh, there's a center say suppose that the loser is losing uh, three hits then the loser will need to lose three pieces and but and basically you assign losses based on the units that you have there that is to be able to assign a hit to a spartan land unit i need to have two of these guys 
to inflict a unit. Uh, these are the units. I need to have these units. So you're matching the number of losses that you inflict on the opponent, but you need to make sure that you match according to this conversion table. This is important because after you match those, those losses, the pool of uh, enemy pieces that you have removed is matched on this at the table to determine how the losses of the winner. So pretty much the, the winner inflicts losses on the loser and then the pool of pieces that have been produced as losses are used to determine the losses on the winner. And the combat naval system is exactly the same just but for the fact that now it is naval units that are worth combat points and the Athenians have superiority because each naval unit is worth two points. Once you determine the winner again, you apply losses in the same way. Winner versus loser, pieces lost by the loser, converted into losses for the winner. Pretty, pretty detailed, right? And this is really, I barely, 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 barely scratch the surface. There are just so many other rules and sub rules and exceptions and exceptions to those rules I haven't even talked about Persia. I haven't even talked about the, the unique capabilities of the of the states about uh, extra procedures like entourage and brain trust. There's a lot more in the game than what I told you about. I just want to give you a general sense of the of the main mechanics. Now the game continues well, a variable period of time depending on the scenario that you're playing. There may be an instant death victory condition. So for example, if uh, uh, Athens doesn't have any granary areas, so there are some areas that are marked as such on the board. If Athens doesn't have control of any of those, then the Spartans win. So victory conditions of that kind. Otherwise, the player will, the, the, the otherwise victory is based on honor points. And uh, well, the, um, the within the side that wins the war, the party that has the most honor is the winner of the game. So you want your city state to win, and then to win personally, you also need to be the player that has the biggest influence within the city state that wins the war. Pericles is probably a very good game, um, may even be a great game. It is just a game that most likely I will not play in the future because it's going to be hard for me to create a situation in which I can play it. Let's try to break down this general idea a little bit. Um, it's an incredibly hard game to get into. Yes, there are videos online, there are tutorials, there are tutorials in the book. Uh, and the very fact that there are all of these things uh, tells you that the designer is very aware that this is going to be a game that's going to be hard for most people to choose, swallow and digest. Uh, you do not have so many tutorials in Connect4 or, you know, checkers. You don't need those. So the fact that they are there makes it easier, but also tells at the same time that the task is going to be hard. It's not so much for the number of rules even. I know they play games that have more rules if we're just brutally, blandly counting how many rules there are. It's just that these rules, uh, although their aim is mimetic, they do represent a theme, they do represent a reality, ultimately. In nature, they feel very abstract. They do, they represent reality at the bird eye view from such a high perspective that it's not always easy to see the theme, to see the connection. If I'm playing, if I'm playing a tactical game, I look at the map and many things on the map act as their own reminders. I see a river, I see a road, I see a forest that reminds me of what they do in the game. Here I have that to some extent. I have certain boxes and certain connections, uh, but I still need to check the details. But then I have a, a, a token that says League, and that League token can be used to do a variety of other things in different theaters with different exceptions under different circumstances. But gets a little, gets harder, gets harder to get into. And diplomacy can be used for many different things. Military seems intuitive, but then everything just comes with long lists of procedures and things to do that at least for me, for, for the way I'm wired, were incredibly hard to patch together cohesively into a single system. And they were hard to learn, but in a sense to memorize, but to learn in the sense of like, really know how to use them. See the interactions, see the interconnections, see the forest that the trees 
are a part of. I could see a lot of trees, but it was very hard to get to the forest. And of course, there is the problem that I'm not the only one. I need three other players that are willing to go through the same training um, to learn the game as myself. And, you know, if I were to look for three players to play Ticket to Ride with, I think it's going to be easier because I already know this is a highly specialized game, highly uh, specialized for a very small niche of dedicated players that really enjoy history, really enjoy politics and diplomacy, and are willing to put in the work to play a game that takes a long time to learn, a lot of effort to learn, mm -hmm. and then also is not particularly uh, quick or easy to play. Even when you become familiar with it, the pace and the flow of the game is still um, not uh, very uh, user-friendly. Again, I'm sure that when you start seeing the forest, it gets better and the game probably will feel very engrossing. I'm not quite at that point yet. Um, but I think that for most players that are willing to put in the work, probably the game will pay off. Why am I not one of these players? Why am I so lazy? Why don't I keep playing the game with my three devoted friends, etc, etc, etc. Especially now, especially now that we went past, I believe, the worst. You know, the game started after, after we, played, uh, we played for a whole afternoon and an entire evening. Uh, the game started moving, we started finally seeing, not the forest maybe, but a patch of trees here and there that seemed to make sense. Um, the rules started flowing from one another a little bit better, and at the point we started having, of course, the next level, the meta level, which is, oh, now we know how to use the rules, it's time to figure out how the heck to use them well, and when to use them, etc, etc, etc. So why do they just continue? It's a very simple, practical reason. Um, there are three friends in the world right now that I can play the game with. I don't feel like introducing anybody new because it was really so hard to work with these friends. And if, you know, the three of, three of us, of us four, three of us are here, are here today to play the game and one doesn't show up, we can't just call at the last minute somebody and maybe the person, because again, there are very few people that will enjoy a game that is so demanding. If we find that person, it's not gonna like, oh, just, just you know, follow along in five minutes, you'll get it. That person, it will take a while before the person learns the procedures, and at the point, simply before the person can see that the, the strategy will take forever, it will just be that person will be sitting there and pretty much uh, listening to what the other players tells them to do. That is simply the way it will work. It's not a game that you will get into and you will start playing and enjoying. It's it, it's it, it's it. You take several hours to learn the game. So what happens? What happens is simply that practically speaking I have three friends that I can play with and for the game really to be good I need all three of them. If I was in college, if I was in grad school, uh, maybe I wouldn't have more free time that I have now, but I have a, would have more flexibility and so would my friends. If I was retired and so were my friends, we would have more time and uh, flexibility in our schedules. And we don't. We are adults, so we have families, and so uh, I don't know when is going to be the first time, we, the next time, which exactly the four of us uh, are going to be willing and available to play the game. So it is just a game that has a niche audience, has pretty much one ideal number of players, and you think, okay, but why don't you just play with two players and use the bots? Because there are a lot of other games uh, that have military elements, diplomatic elements, that give me all that they can give me without the bot. At the end, this is a game for four players, which I think could be a blast if you have managed to have the four friends that come over, they get together over a period of time, it's, it can be a blast. But I have uh, so many other games that express their potential and are a blast, and they still are if at the last minute a friend doesn't show up. Here you need a group of four committed uh, friends uh, that appreciate this kind of like very complicated, very demanding game and are willing also to commit to uh, come to your game night regularly every week uh, for a period of time. I don't think it's impossible. I think there are many groups out there for, for which this may work. Uh, it just doesn't happen to be my, my case. I don't... Again, 
I play games regularly with friends, but they are not always the same friends. I'm, I'm, I, I, I talk about my game group, although very often say we play, we, we meet every 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 week, and sometimes the groups, the individuals that come to the to the game nights are completely completely different. My what I call my group is really a, a very a very loose gathering of of players. So this week I'll play with Drake and Frank, and the following week I'll play with Eric and Ted and another guy that was also called Eric and the following week I'll play with uh, so with Francesco and with Marzia and da 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 um, so for me simply practically pragmatically speaking is gonna be hard and I want to point this out because uh, you may be in a different situation like oh I'm glad I'm not situation like Marco my group just is the right group to play this kind of game then by all means I hope that what you saw in this in this video uh, made you curious about the game, made you want to try and maybe realize, oh, this is exactly what me and my uh, three best friends were looking for. Awesome. It is just a game that I think has a very small niche because it has pragmatic barriers that other games do not have. Games that are easier, so uh, do not have that pragmatic barrier because they can simply draw in uh, players more easily, or, play, or games that are this complex uh, but have more flexibility then I can create a pool of players and if somebody doesn't show up at the last minute or an extra player shows up at the last minute, we can still play. This is a game with those two barriers, the complexity and the exact number of players uh, will make it very hard for me to play in the future. Again, why not the bots? Because the bots are not the real thing and the bots are cumbersome or cumbersome to use. And, and I play the game and I see that the fun interaction is there when we finally were able to get past the diplomatic part is always fun. Then translating those diplomatic elements into all of the cases and subcases on the board is a completely different animal. But the diplomatic part is really interesting, is really fun. And that of course is the first part that you lose when you're playing with an AI, when you're playing with a bot. And maybe you're a solitaire gamer who doesn't mind to use three bots and then you take your turn, you do your action and then all these other bots, etc, etc. To me, again, uh, when I play solitaire games, I prefer games in which I do not have to spend too much time and effort with the AI. The more elegant and simple the AI is, the more time I have to think about what I want to do, rather than implementing the necessary steps to make the AI work, the better. And this is not one such game. Suggestion, recommendation, how about an app? GMT, if you were to come up with an app that took control of, of all, potentially all the parties, then I could play the game solo, choose one of the factions, and the app tells me what the other factions do, uh, just by the, by the push of a button. I don't have to worry about a flowchart. Flowcharts, if I can avoid using flowcharts when I play a solitaire game, I'm happy. I press the button, it tells me what the aristocrats are doing, what the demagogues are doing, etc, etc, etc. Then I'll be happy, then I can totally do that. You you know my, my viewers that I prefer board games to video games, look at my channel, count how many reviews of video games I have or board games I have. But I don't have anything against the app enhanced board games. Last year we had Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition, awesome game made awesome by a companion app, either was an app for this game, then I would consider, then I would consider, well, yes, it's great if it just so happens the stars are right and my friends didn't know how to play the game and are willing to play the game, those three are available, we can get together and play it, awesome. If they're not around, I play my app and simply, uh, easily enough, I can move around the pieces and I can make my decision, yes, then I would, I'd be interested. I'd be very interested, uh, but I think it takes a companion app because otherwise the bots are just a lot of work to do, at least more work than I'm willing to put into this game. Pericles, uh, I don't think I got enough on a pre of an appreciation of what the game can give. I would need to play it more to give you more detailed assessment. What I, what I hope I was able to do is to give a general sense in the main segment of my video, a general feel here in my conclusions of how the game plays, and in particular the possible obstacles that I think some of us, includes me, maybe some of you, may encounter when playing this game, which as a design, as a general idea, is a phenomenal idea, like the intersection of politics, etc. But the implementation is one that just requires a lot of pieces to fall into the right places, and I'm 
the situation I'm in right now is simply not one in which I can easily, I can easily create a situation in which I can play the game often enough, regularly enough to really get into it and to really enjoy it. So to me, it's a game that is possibly very good, possibly great, instant modern classic, but one that has certain pragmatic barriers that will make it very hard for me to play it in the future.